So we'll let's see. Summarize. We'll summarize them all at the end. How about that? So that's tangent hyperbolic is secant hyperbolic squared. Tangent. Next up, cotangent. No. Cosine sine. Let's do secant hyperbolic secant. For hyperbolic secant, of course, I could do derivative secant 1 over cos hx. Uh, but then I need a quotient rule plus the derivative of hyperbolic um, cosine. I think there's an identity that we can avoid this. Which is not find in my notes. Let's see. Hopefully we put a box around it in these notes. I can also use our definition right here, but that's going to be really no better than uh, still going to be quotient rule. see another other than the ones that have squares in them yeah I don't see a nice way to relate the two let's just go with this derivative here so derivative of cos h is sine cinch times 1 minus oh no that's a bad quotient rule what's the derivative of 1 0 minus 1 times derivative of cosh is cinch divided by cos h squared of x. So we got negative sine over cos h times 1 over cos h. So I just split up the cosine squared into 1 over uh, cosine times cosine. So first up, sine over cosine hyperbolic is cotan no, regular tangent. And 1 over cosh is secant. So we got negative tangent secant, or negative, we'll write in the other order, negative secant tangent. Because I think that's the way your, tan your other derivative is written, right? Secants before tangents. So that's hyperbolic secant. Co cosecant. cotangent hyperbolic which is cosh over cinch so I want you to use quotient rule on both of these and compute them out and try to simplify it down to two trig functions multiplied together Derivatives of cinch and cos should be right above, probably, in your notes. Yeah, they should be the top two derivatives right in this section.
know, any algebra calculus questions on that work I've done so far. I'm not exactly sure how I want to simplify this last one down. I think there's a really nice identity for cinch squared minus coach squared. Probably one or negative one. So I'm going to scroll up and find that. So we got cinch minus cosh. I think it's that first identity. Cosh minus cinch is one. So cinch minus cosh will be negative one. So now make that swap. Cinch minus cosh is negative one. And that's negative one over cinch squared, so that's negative cosecant hyperbolic squared. Okay, so we got all six hyperbolic trig functions. We'll just summarize them in a small table. There's our six derivatives. So I could write down some antiderivative formulas from these, but I'm not going to. The reason is I'm not going to give you problems that explicitly have hyperbolic signs and cosines in them. So there are six uh, antiderivatives that go with this, but I'm not going to give you problems that have to do with hyperbolic trig antiderivatives. So I'm going to skip the, the six antiderivatives. we would get here. And what we're going to do next is look at derivatives of inverse hyperbolic trig functions. So that was the whole point of doing all this. So we can look at the derivatives of the inverse to these functions. Write down our inverse identities, hopefully. Nope. Oh, I'm 
reading in the wrong section. Hyperbolic functions. Much better. We'll do example problems first. So first one, what is DDT? Uh, secant hyperbolic of square root x. So what is the only, well you obviously need to know the secant hyperbolic derivative. What is the only other thing you really need to know about derivatives here? You gotta have a chain rule. There'll be a power rule inside, but that's probably, I don't need, probably need to say power rule anymore, but you do have a chain rule going on here. So take this derivative, use it, secant hyperbolic right above, and then some, of course, chain rule. And right, square roots is half powers when you're about to take, do some calculus. Sorry, this is a DDX. Yeah, that variable needs to match everywhere. So I'm going to do a few antiderivatives of hyperbolic trig functions, but only I will keep them off the midterm in the final. So this is only for uh, just practice for us. Not I won't put this on a midterm or a final or some quiz. I need cosecant hyperbolic of x squared, oh, squared of x squared for this to work out. So let's write down the cosecant hyperbolic antiderivative, cosecant squared hyperbolic antiderivative. So there, if we look over here, there's going to be an antiderivative I can use. So the antiderivative. I'm using the last one here. Antiderivative of the right side is the left side. I'm going to move that negative that was there to the other side. So it's going to equal negative cotangent x plus constant. And it, I can switch to use oops, cosecant h squared x dx u du
So what is preventing us from applying this integral cosecant squared UDU in our problem here? There's no 2. Well, there's a 2, but it's the problem that x is squared. So let's try u sub. What's good u sub? Uh, x squared. x squared, and what is du? 2x dx. I see everything except the 2. I see an x dx. I don't see a 2. So we just divide by 2. 1 half du equals x dx, and we're ready to make our sub. So we have 1 half integral cosecant hyperbolic of u du. So there's our x dx that swapped out. And now I can use the cosecant squared u du. Antiderivative is negative cotangent. Hyperbolic of u plus c. What is bad about the way I wrote this down? Should be a subtract, uh, multiplied by negative. So we get negative one half cotangent hyperbolic. Remember, u is something that we made up because we couldn't take the antiderivative in our head. U is x squared. So it's cotangent x squared plus c. And there's our antiderivative. So this is going to be our last example before we go to inverse hyperbolic trig functions. We could try u sub. So this doesn't look like our six derivatives we just computed. There's no e to the x in any of these. So we could try u sub. I would either try u equals cosh hyperbolic of x or u equals e to the x. That would be two reasonable choices. But I know derivatives cosh won't have e to the x, and derivatives e to the x won't have cosh. So that's not really going to help. So if u sub doesn't work so well, let's try regular algebra. What do we know about hyperbolic cosine of x? And how does it relate to e to the x? If e equals e to the x plus e to the negative x. So let's use the definition. It's got some e to the x's. Maybe we'll be able to use that with some algebra and cancel some stuff out. So I'm going to use the definition of cosh hyperbolic. And I don't like fractions of fractions, so let's go multiply by e to the negative x times whatever this cosh is. So I didn't do anything fancy there. But now we're going to multiply e to the x, e to the negative x through the numerator. So this is x minus x plus e minus x minus x dx. I used on this last step is split up antiderivative over addition. So if you got one function plus another function, you can just take two integrals out of the area separately. All right, I did this because it makes the first antiderivative super easy. What is the antiderivative of 1 dx? X. X. You can always check 
that's your guess, derivative x is 1. So that works out. Plus, how do I deal with this e to the negative 2x dx? U sub. So let's try u sub here. What's a good u sub? Negative 2x. So we'll go negative 2x, basically pick the uh, exponent right there. This is a good u sub because the derivative is just a constant. So we're not going to get any new x's in here. So du negative 2x, nope, just negative 2 dx. We don't have a negative 2. So we'll bring that negative 2 to the other side as a negative 1 half. So you get negative 1 half integral e to the u du. Any u sub questions? And this is the easiest antiderivative. Is there anyone I can think of? What's the antiderivative of e to the u? e to the u. It's the only antiderivative that's itself. So we have negative 1 fourth e to the u. We do need a plus constant. This is an actual subtraction sign now. And this is not a good final answer. We are done doing calculus, but why is this not a good final answer? It's got a u. So u is something we had to use because we couldn't just figure it out immediately. So we got to unsubstitute. That is negative 2x. So as our antiderivatives get more complicated, Usually to check, you take it, well, always to check, you take a derivative. And usually your derivative is far easier than your antiderivative. So depends on the function, but you're taking your derivative and checking is probably five times faster, approximately, than getting your derivative in the first, or your antiderivative in the first place. And if you are on your midterm and you go to check and you take your derivative and you're wrong and you have 10 seconds left, you can always write a note, I checked that my uh, antiderivative was wrong, but I don't have time to make it correct. I usually give you one extra point if you can tell me your answer was wrong. Believe me, I will know. But if you tell me it was wrong, um, I generally give you one extra point because you went and checked. So I do read your answers and your work pretty carefully, so you, the chance of you answering wrong and getting it correct is pretty low. So don't worry if you write down that I'm wrong, or that you're wrong and why, I usually give you an extra point for that. Now we're going to invert all these functions. And we're only going to invert, nope, we'll invert all six. All right. We'll start out with cosh inverse, which is written the way you would expect. Do not write cosh, do not write what I wrote in the red there. So this is not the inverse cosine hyperbolic. This is the, so that's not good. This is the hyperbolic cosine inverse of x. So I don't know what in the world that is, but don't put your negative first power, your invert symbol next to co cosine is hyperbolic cosine. So first property, we'll flip this around to be the regular function. This is the same as cosh y equals x. And of course, you have to restrict. Well, this one you have all y. Nope, that is not all y. That is all y greater than 0, greater than or equal to 0. Next up. Cinch inverse, 
which cinch y equals x, and this is all y in the real numbers. Last up for the three is tangent. So this x equals hyper tan hy. And this one works for all real numbers y. Uh, we had to, let's see, H, if you want to look at that a little more carefully, let's look at the right side function right here, because I have a nice definition for that. Uh, cosh inverse is defined to be the inverse of the cosh function, so let's look at the one we actually have a standard definition for. That's e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. And I think if we go graph it, we will figure out why when we invert it, we have to be careful. Um, does it matter that that's a y and those are x's? Yes, that, yeah, they should all be y's here. Now I want to go graph it. Actually, we can use Desmos to graph this, and I think that'll let us graph with y's. So x equals cosh hy. x equals, just type, it in. Just, type it, just do a fraction like that divided by the other one. Oh, there we go. Wow. So I had e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. Ooh, should it be? Um, that won't work without both of those being a Y. Oh, that's pretty important. Um, it was Y's on the right side? Yeah. All right. Oh, it's part of a parabola, right? Or a hyperbola, which looks a lot like a parabola. All right, so what's going on here? So if we look at this graph, drawn like this, could I say that they won't let me draw in here. Oh, let's get really fancy, I think. Snip. Snipping tool. There we go. Perfect. Copy. Paste. All right. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, look at the this lag. Yeah, mouse. That looks like it's hitting one. All right, just from the graph. 
So it doesn't have restrictions on Y, but it certainly has restrictions on X. How do I move this thing? Oh, perfect. Okay, so this is the graph of what I just typed in. Uh oh, I cannot scroll anymore. Try to close it and reopen. They're not letting me scroll around. All right, we're back. So I wasn't exactly ready to answer this question. So let's look at this graph now. This graph is cosh equals e to the y. Cosh, oh yeah. So is, if is, So from this graph is, or can you write y as a function of x? So is this a function if we take this graph here? A function, is y a function of x? No. Why not? Because if uh, you pick a x value, let's just pick 6, I got two y values right here. So not a function of, you pick any number you want that's bigger than 1, and you'll find two y values. So how do we make it a function of x? We basically throw away parts of this graph. So what part does it make sense to throw away? Should I throw away where y's are negative, or should I throw away where y's are positive? Are yeah, let's keep it positive. So let's get rid of the bottom half of this graph. So if I want to say this in one inequality, what inequality do I use to get rid of all this bottom stuff? And I can't use x inequality because same x values are for both. I can't just say throw out when x is greater than 1. So we're going to use our y value and say when y is less than 0, we're going to throw it away. I, let's see. So what this graph tells you, basically, you can't solve for y in this equation. If you solve for y, you would get y equals some plus or minus some, uh, let's call it g of x. Just from looking at this, if I had some serious algebra skills, I probably could solve for y. But I would get a positive or negative, just looking at what the graph gave us. Um, so I could go with absolute value, but by doing that, I'm, choosing, I'm basically making a choice which is the same as that choice right there. Now, I don't want to go and graph the 
Actually, the other ones work for all y, so I don't really need to graph those or look at those at all. So that's the details of what's going on, of, of why we had to restrict y. Okay. So we'll look at some inverse hyperbolic trig identities now. So just like hyperbolic secant and hyperbolic cosine are reciprocal, not inverses, but reciprocals of each other. The inverse reciprocals work a little differently. So I'll write the a wrong one over here. Intuitively, it makes some sense, but is not mathematically correct. So it is true that secant and cosecant are reciprocals, but they're inverses. They are reciprocals, but not on their outputs. They're reciprocals on their inputs. And that's a little strange. So that's what you see on the left. The input is getting reciprocated, not the output, which is what would be on the right. So you're going to recip CIP. The inputs, not outputs. And we get similar for our other cosecant inverse hyperbolic is sine hyperbolic inverse 1 over x. And last, cotangent. Hyperbolic inverse is tan hyperbolic inverse 1 over x. And we'll look at, we'll just prove one of these. And all we're going to do in the proof is basically unwind the definition. So we'll prove the first one. And just like before, we'll start on one of the two sides. And so I'm not sure they're equal. So let's start on the complicated side, which would be the right-hand side with that 1 over x. So we're going to start here. Now, unfortunately, I don't know very much about cosine hyperbolic inverse of x at all. The only thing I really know about it, I only wrote it down for the first time here. So what do I know? I know I can flip it into a regular hyperbolic cosine, except I need a y on the other side or some other variable on the other side. So I'm just going to introduce a new variable. We'll go ahead and use y. So I'm going to let y equal cosine hyperbolic inverse of x. And we're going to do a whole bunch of algebra hopefully to get down to seek hyperbolic inverse x. So let's get started. I'm going to move hyperbolic cosine to the other side. So what I want to get is secant hyperbolic. How do I turn cosine hyperbolic into a secant hyperbolic? We don't have to worry about inverses at the moment. What's that? So yeah, so co uh, hyperbolic cosine is 1 over uh, hyperbolic secant. So 
So I'm going to use basically the definition right there. So it's 1 over seek hyperbolic y. Now, I'm trying to solve for secant hyperbolic inverse, so I have to reciprocate both sides. So I'm going to take both sides and flip them over seek hy equals x. And what is the last step I need to make? You need to put the secant hyperbolic on the other side. So I need to move the yeah, function to the opposite side by taking the inverse. So this means y equals seek hyperbolic inverse of x, which is what we wanted to find. So that was the secant hyperbolic inverse x. We can erase there. We arrived at our destination. What is y? y started out cos hyperbolic inverse 1 over x. So that is y right there. So that's what we're trying to show right there. So we had to basically invert the function, use properties, and then uninvert or reinvert. Yeah, if you invert twice, you're back to where you started. So you could either say uninvert or reinvert. All right, so that was one of them. You proved the other ones the exact same way. Cosh, yep. Yeah, that was. So I'm just going off what we said what y was right there. So that is cosh inverse 1 over x. All right, so now we have these. Let's go ahead and take derivatives. So I don't know about the derivative of cosh h inverse. So how did we do derivatives when we didn't know anything about the inverse function? It was that section called inverse function. So we're going to use our ddx f inverse x. And this is 1 over regular f prime of f inverse x. And remember, never, and I'll do this in red, this is bad notation. Technically, technically, this equals the derivative of f inverse of x, but I think that's a really bad way to write it. So if you parenthesize it, it would look like f inverse primed. But that's not a good way to write it. So I recommend you write the derivative of f inverse on the right side. So this is bad notation. Over here is good notation. So if you're going to mess around with derivatives of inverses, don't use prime because you're going to have a prime right next to a negative 1. And it'll look like negative 11 or something like that. All right, so we're going to use this. We're going to first be careful about what all our functions are. So regular f is hyperbolic cosine. We need to figure out what is f prime and what is f inverse. So what is derivative of, hy of hyperbolic cosine? Regular cinch. You don't get those negative signs on the, you get them in weird places, but not on derivative cosine. Now f inverse is just f inverted. So not much, just put a negative first power with the inverse symbol on it. And now I'm using this uh, 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. So that's a 1 over f prime is sine hyperbolic of f inverse. So this is the derivative, but it's a very ugly version. 
how did we sort this out in regular trig functions? There's two ways we did it. One way was draw a triangle and use Pythagorean theorem. You got basically two sides, and you figure out your other side and which sides we're talking about. Unfortunately, there is no triangle anymore. So we're going to basically use algebra and the identities that we had before. So the first step is the same. We're going to pick some variable and let our variable equal cos hyperbolic inverse x. I could go theta equals, but I don't want to think about theta as an angle. So if I write theta equals, my brain is going to think theta is an angle. So let's pick a different letter. I don't see y used anywhere, so let's just go with y. And go that route. So we need to simplify sine h cos h inverse x. So the first thing we did was move the function to the other side. And then we can call our original sine h of y now. How do sine, hyperbolic, and cosine relate? There's a couple ways to relate them. We'll use that almost Pythagorean relationship that we used before. It was that cosh squared minus sine cinch squared equals 1? Yeah. So use this as, was our original identity, cosh. So I'm going to use y's cosh squared y minus cinch squared y equals 1. So that means cinch. Let's subtract sine to the other side, subtract 1. cosh squared y minus 1 equals cinch squared y, and now square root. Cinch. So we got to decide plus or minus, and then the other thing, let's see, cinch y. So we're going to have to make a plus or minus choice, but I'll just write this in here now. Oop. We better get back to x's first. So cosh y equals x, we're going to use that. So this is x squared minus 1. So that was just a unsubstitution back into x's. And I still have to decide plus or minus. Now, at some point, I think we, so our cosh, this one required y to be greater than or equal to 0. I'm just going off of somewhere up here, trig, there we go, when y is greater than 0. So I'm using that first condition we needed right there. So starting with the plus. doing. Yeah, that's okay, that's okay. And so our final when we un make this simplification it's one over this. when you're in the hyperbolic world.